the siege in France over with two separate hostage situations ending in the deaths of three terrorists. Also, we have a live look right there on your screen of Knoxville, Tennessee, where President Obama is expected to make remarks that's coming at any moment. We want to get you up to speed, though, on the very latest. An explosive ending for two deadly hostage situations in Paris. Three terrorists, at least four hostages, have been killed in two incidents that authorities say are linked. Over to northern Paris, French officers uh, killed Saeed and Sharif Kouachi. They are the brothers responsible for Wednesday's attack on satirical newspaper Charlie Hebdo that left 12 people dead. They had been holding one person hostage in a small printing house in northern Paris. That was earlier. At the same time in eastern Paris, authorities kill a third gun gunman, Amadi uh, Koulibaly. He was responsible for killing a French policewoman yesterday with accomplice Hayat Boumedin. Koulibaly was holding as many as 20 people hostage in a kosher market in Paris. At least four of the hostages have been killed. At least four others were seriously injured. Boumedin's whereabouts right now currently unknown. I want to bring in the panel. We have Jonathan Gilliam. He is a former Navy SEAL. Tom Ruskin is a former NYPD detective investigator. Lisa Daftari is the founding editor of MideastFaces.com. She's also a Fox News contributor. Thank you to all of you for joining us. First of all, how critical is it that we find that fourth suspect, that woman? Well, I'd say it's pretty critical. I mean, uh, I think the most important part was actually uh, ending these two uh, sieges that were going on. Um, but now that she's on the run, we don't know what part she played in it, how dangerous she is. Look, just because she's a female, uh, a human being that is bent on killing is a very dangerous creature, male or female. So if that's who she is and that's her M.O., they need to find her. It would have been, or would it have been better to take some of those other suspects alive so that we had more information about what was going on? These are people who are heavy, very heavily armed and willing to kill, mm -hmm. and you take them any way you can. If you have to shoot them and kill them, chances are if they hadn't shot and killed them, they would have killed more of the hostages in mm -hmm. there. And we don't know what kind of explosives they had on them as of yet. So does it make finding this fourth person even more critical then? Yeah, because she had trained with one of the other hostage takers. She is heavily armed, as far as we know, and she is capable of killing. To Jonathan's point, you have to find her and not assume that just because she's a woman, she's not capable of killing. She is capable of killing. Yeah. Lisa, what's your takeaway from all this? I think what's important is, um, and these two gentlemen can talk about strategy, but important to take a look at context and put this into what can we take away from this whole thing. It's how expansive, well-coordinated, and, and well-carried out this entire mission was. From earlier this week to um, what happened today, I mean, it's very scary how, you know, I, we should take out of our lexicon um, phrases like lone wolf terrorists. Or why? homegrown, why is that, why homegrown is that terrorists. These two gentlemen, born and raised in Paris, they're Parisian, but they had connections to Yemen, to the headquarters of Al Qaeda, not only to the uh, to the terror group Al Qaeda, but to actual individuals who were involved in planning, especially uh, oh. these these attacks on the West. So obviously. The, Yemen is a, a hot spot. It's not safe as we thought it was. And there is more of, of um, and, and Paris has been pretty much, you know, has been a little bit in denial about what has been under the surface existing. The problem of anti-Semitism has been there for a long time. Between 100 and 200,000 uh, Parisian, or, or I should say French, Jews immigrated from Paris to Israel just this year, knowing that there was this anti-Jewish, um, you know, sentiment under yeah. the surface. You mentioned Al-Qaeda because these are some of the details that have come to light. Saeed visited Yemen to receive weapons training from Al-Qaeda. How significant is that? Well, I think it's very significant. And going off what uh, Lisa was just saying, we have to stop looking at these individuals as homegrown or lone wolves. The fact is they are operatives. It doesn't matter if ISIS trained them, Al-Qaeda trained them. It doesn't matter if they came from the United States, Australia, or Paris. They are a part of an ideology that is at war with the world. And we have to start looking at that and realizing that we are at war, that these operations are going to continue. And when they have the ability in France to just jump over, get some training, and come back, which okay. is very easy, that's a big deal.
Um, the president is going to come to the podium here in a moment, and we're going to listen in to what he has to say, because even though he's supposed to talk about education, no doubt he will make comments about what happened here. Uh, I'm sorry, what happened in Paris. We'll go ahead and listen in. Please have a seat. Uh, well, it is good to be back in Tennessee. Uh, I, hope, I hope you guys aren't getting tired of me. I've been, I've been coming around a lot lately. Because uh, there's a lot of good stuff happening here. Um, I want to begin by thanking uh, Joe and Joe Biden. Uh, they're not just good friends uh, and, and good partners, but uh, they really believe in the power of education. And they really believe in uh, creating those kinds of ladders to opportunity that gave all three of us and Michelle uh, the chances, the incredible opportunities that we've had today. Um, and they understand the promise of America's community colleges. Uh, well, Jill really understands it, and Joe, <laughs> he, he doesn't really have a choice. But, uh, um, before I get into the reason that I'm here today, I, I want to begin uh, by saying just a few words about uh, the tragic events that we've watched unfold in France over the last several hours and days. And, uh, because events have been fast moving this morning, I want to make sure to comment on them. Uh, I just spoke to my counterterrorism advisor. Uh, we have been in close touch with the French government throughout this uh, tragedy. Uh, the moment that the outrageous attack took place, we directed uh, all of our law enforcement and counterintelligence uh, operations to provide whatever support uh, that our ally needs in confronting this challenge. Uh, we're hopeful that the immediate threat is now resolved, uh, thanks to the courage and professionalism of the French personnel on the ground. But the French government continues to face the threat of terrorism and has to remain vigilant. The situation is fluid. President Hollande's made it clear that they're going to do whatever is necessary to protect their people. Uh, and I think it's important for us to understand France is our oldest ally. Uh, I want the people of France to know that the United States stands with you today stands with you tomorrow. Our thoughts and prayers uh, are with the families who have been uh, directly impacted. Uh, we grieve with you. We fight alongside you to uphold our values, the values that we share, uh, universal values uh, that bind us together as friends and as allies. And in the streets of Paris, the world seen once again what terrorists stand for. They have nothing to offer but hatred and human suffering. And we stand for freedom and hope and the dignity of all human beings. And that's what the city of Paris represents to the world. And, and, and that spirit will endure forever, long after the scourge of terrorism is banished from this world. So, I'm in Knoxville not only because I just like Knoxville. <laughs> All right, we're going to dip out of this for a second because we want to go back to the serious topic that we're talking about. You heard right there he made some comments about what went on in Paris, what's been going on in France in general. He said, um, hopefully the immediate threat is resolved. Did you, I mean, you all sort of flinched when he said that, what'd you think? Yeah, I thought, you know, this is the mistake that we, we generally make after every single incident. It's done. In three days, no one will remember this happened. And if we take a look at this as a lone wolf kind of attack, or again, homegrown terrorism, we use these things to dismiss what this actually was. We have to look at this as a military attack, just like any nation would attack France. It's as if, you know, or Sydney, that could happen anywhere. It was so well coordinated. They got away so easily. Imagine the thousands of, of officials that were after these guys and had trouble. It was a challenge getting to them. So, you know, yeah. we have, we're doing a disservice to the world at large, the free I world at large. Go ahead, Tom. I think yeah. part of the takeaway here is one of these guys was on their watch list. He was, both, of yes. them, both of the brothers were on our watch list, so couldn't have made it into the United States. You're talk, and you're talking about, Saeed, the fact that he went to Yemen. Both American and French officials were aware of this. And, and were did follow him yes. at one point. Go ahead. And because of budgetary restraints, they stopped following him. Had they followed him, they may have known what he was planning and may have been able to stop it. And I think, to Lisa's point, I think that that's one of the takeaways, that we have to devote the resources and the manpower and the knowledge mm -hmm. that 
could happen anywhere in our world, and it is happening in our world. Yeah. Uh, I want to bring in on the phone right now the president and founder of the American Islamic Forum for Democracy. He's also the author of A Battle for the Soul of Islam, an American Muslim Patriot's Fight to Save His Faith. He joins us now on the phone. Uh, Zudi, what, what is your take right now? What do you think of what the president just said? Well, I also cringed. I mean, how many whack-a-moles do we need to get before we realize that this is a war of ideas, that it's not a war on terror, it's a, it's a war against an ideology that has declared war on freedom and liberty and on the West? I mean, if people say, where are the voices of moderate Islam? The president's too busy telling us it's not Islamic. You have the radicals who've, who've dominated and, and, and used violence and also major governments. I mean, today the Saudi Arabians are, are flogging a liberal blogger who has an organization very similar to ours because he dared question their leadership of Islam. And he's a Sunni Muslim who's a devout Muslim, and yet we are continuing to say, well, the problem's gone now and the violence is gone. And we're not treating the problem. This is a long war, and it's not only what we're against, which is the violence, but are we promoting liberty abroad? Are we letting those in the streets of the Arab awakening know because the Muslim Brotherhood was rejected by the majority of Egyptians. And yet we didn't make it clear that that was an ideology, the Islamist ideology, that won elections in Egypt and Tunisia and now has been rejected is something that's fueling all of these acts. Yeah. Zudi, what, would you, what do you think the American public should take away from what, ha what has happened over the past few days here? It should take away that these are symptoms of a deeper problem, that we can't just engage it right a few days after the incident, that it needs a persistence. In the Cold War, we knew it was not only the Soviets, it was global communism that was a threat. Now we should realize that, you know, remember, we had hundreds of experts in Soviet war theory in the Pentagon and the State Department. We had a U.S. information agency that was countering that. Today, there are but a few experts, and those don't even want to be named because of the uh, they get called bigots and Islamophobes. So I hope the American public realizes that us reformers are out there. But we yeah. need to be engaged, and we need to have a strategy. It's a good point. Jonathan, um, he called it an outrageous attack. Mm -hmm. He didn't say terror, the president. Meaningful? Not, are we making too big of a deal out of that? So you can add that, and I'm going to try to stay, say this. It's a political statement, but it, the fact is, NYPD, I'm former FBI as well as a SEAL. I just saw a commander-in-chief come on and joke around yeah. and then he goes in and and talks about this thing that is the most serious thing going on right now yeah. i mean the fact is what happened there can happen here and it is terrorism mm -hmm. and it's a world war it's sweeping all over the place and but people they don't want to look at it that way because it's not tanks and it's not large uh, troops going out it, and it may not ever be successful in taking over the world However, it is successful at causing a lot of fear and terror and killing a lot of people. Yeah. And I, I'm appalled by the way that he came out, acted like he did, and then said that and downplayed it to a terrible attack. We have to have leaders in place now that are ready to be warriors when you have to be a warrior. We're going to pause there for just a second, Zudi. Thank you so much. Events in